quite cautious what they're saying, but it, I think that, that all of the riders believe it's certainly a step better, but nobody knows exactly how much until a race happens to them. Well, also uh, being asked from uh, our excellent listeners on the subject of uh, Yamaha and how uh, we've already said, you know, they don't look to quite have perhaps the outright pace and, and clear of the field that uh, we might have expected. Maybe Speed of Conviction has asked, does Yamaha uh, need Fabio more or does Fabio need Yamaha more? Huh. I think that's pretty obvious, judging by the fact that he's been the fastest Yamaha man by a big margin often. Um I think Quattararo really you know, saved Yamaha's bacon last year, and I think we might be heading that way again this year. We'll wait and see, but um, I'm I'm surprised that Yamaha don't seem to have made the progress that that even Quattararo was expecting uh, in the overall performance of the motor. Um, the Yamaha is probably the most beautiful motorbike to ride. I mean, like it seems to do generally everything you want everywhere you want it to do it. But those extremes, it's a funny thing, you know, when you race motorbikes. I mean, I've had motorbikes that um, are really, really nice to race, real good, good everywhere. But you still want the one that's edgy and wants to kill you. That, that That's the bike you want, or the, the one that's just got that little bit more. And if you can ride it, you'll get that little bit more from it. And that's always been the, the Honda situation with Marquez. You know, he's able to extract that little bit extra because it's there for him if he's brave enough, if he's good enough to use it. Um, I think the the Yamaha is probably a slightly more mild amount of bike overall. And when I'm talking mild, I'm talking like minute detail, my minute amount of, of difference, really. But but it is the difference. You know, sometimes those full on factory bikes are absolute animals to ride. But once you've got that, once you can extract that extra little percentage out of it, that's what makes the difference to to permanently putting it on the podium it's a surprise isn't it harry that i mean quattro has been saying since what midway through last year maybe before he just wants more horsepower more top speed the one thing he's been asking for and and he hasn't got it and it's i think right up until the eve of the sepang test there's, there's the team launch just before the official sepang test and the the team manager massimo merigali very respected guy ex racer himself even he said you know the top priority was to improve the, the straight line performance so you know you're thinking right well they've got something here you know let's see when they go on track tomorrow and then you see the top speeds coming through and you realize they're no better off than they were before this quattro he gave the figure of nine kilometers an hour at mandalika this was he said well look it was that last year and it's it's the same today and I mean, it, it's almost like, the, I don't know, the, everyone knew what Kotari wanted, except the, the engineers at Yamaha. I don't know exactly what happened there. And that's what comes back to what I was saying earlier on. You know, if you've got a motorcycle that over one lap, when you've got no one else around you, Quattararo can put a very fast lap time in. When you've got other riders that can get a nine kilometers an hour bike underneath you into a braking area or somewhere else where you can interfere with your lap, your lap time will be much slower because, you know, you're not able to take that perfect line that you want to be able to take on your slightly slower Yamaha because you've got a Honda underneath you, you've got a Ducati underneath you. It's all very well doing a one-lap wonder when you're um, when you're testing on your own with a bit of space and maybe a bit of a slipstream you can pull on somebody somewhere. But as soon as you get into a race where you've got other people all over the racetrack in, in, in you know, pertinent areas, it's a, it's a real problem for Yamaha, I think. And that's why Quattararo will have wanted that extra little bit of horsepower just to give him the chance to to open up the possibilities in a we race. You should also say just about Yamaha, a bit of a surprise, that the project leader has been promoted out of the team, hasn't he? Uh, Sumi. So they finally win the world championship, their first one since 2015. And, and basically, it sounds like he's off to a to a desk job in Japan. He's going. I think he's going to become a general manager of the motorsports division or, or something like that. So again, you've got, if you're Quattararo, you, your pen's hovering on a contract, perhaps. You haven't got the top speed. You've got this uncertainty of losing the top guy in the race team. Uh, now, the replacement, I think it's a, it's a guy called Seki. He's he's come from within the team, so he is someone that's known to them. But still, it, it's just another little change that perhaps might catch you off guard. Uh, you, you can understand why Quattararo might just wait and see how this bike does in the first few races before he decides what he wants to do. He'd be wise to do that, wouldn't he? Where will Quattararo go? Quattro, I said it, Quattararo, Quattararo, Quattararo. Sorry, I knew I was thinking the whole mind. How am I going to say this? How am I going to say this? And I'm 
bugging it up. Fabio. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should say, actually, that, that Fabio, you're on the good side. He's, although he's saying, look, this is a, a big sort of issue that we've got this top speed. He's not in any way down or sulky or, you know, he's his usual chirpy self. He's saying, well, look, there's no point pondering about it or worrying about it. We haven't got the top speed. We'll just have to adapt as we did last year. So, you know, he's not, although he clearly hasn't got what he wanted and what he was making clear, he, he, he didn't come across as sort of downbeat or, or anything in, in sort of dealing with us. Behind closed doors and what he might be saying there, who knows? But certainly, you know, it wasn't a, you know, a, a downbeat Fabio Quattararo in testing. And he was fast, let's be honest. He, he, he did look, again, as Keith was saying, clearly the fastest Yamaha rider. You've got to say that Yamaha need him at the moment more than he needs them. Yeah, and it's well, it's certainly tight, isn't it? Just based off te- uh, testing, and uh, Andy Preston has uh, said that given there's going to be between four and six Ducatis in the top ten uh, for this year, the championship is surely going to be Mister Consistency in much the way 2020 was for Joanne Mir. Do you think that's a fair assessment of how the season will go? It's motorbike racing. I noticed that Pete didn't jump on that one too quickly. <laughs> I mean, Ducati, again, we talked about data earlier on. To have more motorbikes in the field you know, with quality riders on them, you're going to be pulling in all of that data early. The thing is to get yourself in a position where, you know, Friday afternoon, you're in a position. You're moving forward as, a, as, a, as an entity. And Ducati have obviously got that one fairly well covered. You know, and so consistently over the year, you would expect Ducati to be the team really i would expect them to be the team um top riders bikes are good more bikes on the track than anybody else it's got to be something that that is is going to be an advantage for ducati ktm have fallen behind a little bit you alluded to it earlier on with the the, you know the tech 3 ktm uh, garage you know a little bit at sea at the moment you know obviously the wrist injury for remy gardner that's not how you want to start your uh, year in motor gp that's for sure you know, I think that there's there's plenty of work to be done at KTM at the minute. And all that progress they made so quickly went up in smoke virtually in the second half of last year. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they respond to that. Um, and again, concessions. There's still only Aprilia that have got concessions. And they're right up there at the minute. I mean, concessions to anybody that, that, that doesn't know too much about MotoGP or hasn't watched this podcast before. Concessions are something that teams have depending on uh, the, the performance that they've had in in past races and Aprilia because their performances have only just started to come good have got concession they got they're able to to bring new parts to to each and every racetrack you know performance parts and the like they can change their motorbikes through the year whereas everyone else is going to be locked in with the performance of their motorbikes come Qatar that's it uh, once we've got to Thursday at Qatar I think it's um, it's all done and dusted whatever you've got that's what you're running for the rest of the year no engine modifications at all um but Aprilia have got opportunities to make changes. Now, to see Aprilia going as well as they are in these early tests, again, with that proviso underneath it that I've said a thousand times already, you can't rely on the tests as a true performance factor for the rest of the year, in my view. Alicia Spargro is a man that makes a motorbike go fast over a, over a short period of time, over a, a one lap or two lap se- session. So we would have expected that. Maverick Vinales, at the beginning of every year, is always the fastest man. And so he's up there on the Aprilia as well. But these aren't misleading in my view indicators for the rest of the year um it's going to be a tight year but ducati definitely have an advantage for me i think the interesting well, thing with the ducati sorry harry is that the gp21 no, no. you've almost got this crossover haven't you i think we thought the 22 would come in and instantly be be better but at the moment it seems like they're, they're pretty much at the same level coming into the start of this season the new engine seems to be taking some setting up uh, engine braking issues i think some of the gp22 guys were having and things like that so You've got guys on this 21 that, that I mean, Banyai described it as perfect by the end of last year, going into a season with this bike that's fine-tuned, working really well, great top speed. But that's data. It's Again, it's data. They're not getting the kind of data they want from the first first tests that they've had this year. I mean, it's a situation where they're... You know, you, that's what the techs need. It's what I said again earlier on in this conversation was that forget about the riders. Yeah, they're going to be grumpy that they can't do what they want to do and put in the best times. But you imagine what it's like being a tech at the minute, trying to read through all that electronic information and trying to put that right in on racetracks that aren't evolving. I mean, quite often you can end up with a situation where a bike goes faster on a racetrack, looks good on a race time, and you think, right, now let's put it back to what it was previously 
just to rule out the fact that it's rider development, that it's a rider that's got faster on a racetrack. You know, it's a moving target all of the time. You, you know, you might think as a tech that you've hit the nail on the head when your rider starts going faster by a couple of tenths or whatever it is. But if you're stuck him back on the, the previous setting that you had and he goes just as fast, you know, it's him, not you. It's a proper, proper, you know, like I say, it's a, it's a conundrum that, that I th- don't think the techs have really got had the time this year so far. I feel sorry for him. I really do. It's uh, it's a tough job being out there on a racetrack at the moment, trying to get uh, get these motorcycles going how they want them to go with the lack of testing. I think the testing. promising thing for the Aprilia, just going back to that, is it was fast straight away as soon as it came onto the track, a bit like the Honda. And that's, as you say, Keith, taking aside timesheets and everything else, just that initial impression that the riders have. And they were saying when Savadori rolled that bike out of the pits at Sepang for the shakedown test, it went well. And it stayed pretty much in the top three right the way through the shakedown, the official test. So it's a promising start for Aprilia. As you say, Aleix also said exactly what you're saying, Keith. He said, look, racing is different to testing. He's also concerned about being held up in the corners by the other bikes. He thinks that the Aprilia is better on its own, really, at the moment. But again, he said, you don't know until you have a race. Benales looks be- looks looks quicker than he was last year, let's say. But he's saying, I'm a long way off being com- fully comfortable on this bike yet. You've got KTM. They've made... Big changes to the project, small changes to the bike is almost how it appears, isn't it? And as you say, they're the ones that, at least on the timesheets, are clearly playing catch up at the moment. They seem to be wanting to give Danny Pedrosa a lot more, let's say, influence on the development process. The concessions thing, as you were saying, Keith, I think that really sort of knocked them for six more than we realised last year. And as Pitt Byer was saying, you know, we can't be testing chassis in, on Friday morning with the race team. You know, we've got to get away from that before they could do with concessions, hire a track, take the race team, test the parts and then go to the race weekend knowing what they've got. They couldn't do that last year. And I think it sort of wrong footed them. So they need Danny Pedrosa to handle more of that. He's going to be at more races, talking to the riders, understanding what they need and sort of trying to take away that. As Pit Byer put it, the race team has to race. And, and I think that's where the changes at KTM. And then they're doing these sort of they're swapping parts. They're being careful not to make big changes. Now, will that be enough? We need to wait and see. But it certainly, it's it's it. Perhaps it's you know they've gone from making new bike, new bike, new bike, as you would expect for a, a manufacturer that's just coming into the sport. Now they're into that kind of refinement phase. But um, but yeah, they certainly. I mean, Brad Binder, he seemed happier. Reattraction is what the one thing they were looking for. He seemed to have found a bit of that. That was the one thing that you were lacking at Mandalika with all that dirt and dust. So it gave him a chance to work on that at least. As always uh, with this podcast, time escapes us, uh, but we do have uh, time for one more listener question. Thank you so much for sending them all in as well. This one is from Andrew Hiley um, about the tracks. As all of the tracks now have this green tarmac strip around them, should they now get rid of the curbs entirely? They're slippery, they get wet and they're dangerous. Um, Is it just better to have the green tarmac, which is off limits to the riders? Well, you've got a problem there on several fronts, haven't you? Because a lot of these tracks are not just um, exclusive to motorcycle racing. There's also the Carboys that we've got to look after as well, which is, I mean, they give us give us a fair amount of respect when it comes to what we want from a racetrack. They don't always like the way that motorbikes have a track set for, for them. Um, it's the same the other way around. It's, it's a compromise all of the time. So um, removing the curbs, I can't see that happening most of the time. Um, Track limits is a massive issue and being old school, you know, you can't have a strip of grass like an old school person would normally say because it's unsafe and safety has to be paramount. So it has to be tarmac. It has to be grippy. Um, Track limits have to be an electronically monitored thing, which goes against the grain again for an old schooler like me. You know, in it was it was a self penalty if you drifted off the line back in the day because you were trying to sort out a motorbike that was trying to throw you through the fence if you went offline. Nowadays, you've got that massive safety area that you can roll out onto and wait to cop a penalty from somebody looking at a monitor or checking out a a, a sensor. Um, It's the way of things. We're in 2022. It's how it has to be. Um, I don't see... There are some racetracks where certainly you could change. For instance, when that white line comes across a little early and, and you get a penalty for crossing over the white line, touching a bit of the green or whatever it might be, when there is no gain to actually be had by by being over there. So therefore, it shouldn't necessarily be penalised. Those kind of little things. I'm thinking 
places like Mizano, where you've got that, you know, onto the Strait of Mizano, and you've got that little triangle of greenery that it's almost through laziness that you come out the corner, you've done everything, it's all there. All you've got to do is tuck in and squirt the throttle, but you've just run across the green because you can. It's not because you want to or have to, it's just the way it is. Uh, so I think those things need tidying up to some extent. Um, but other than that, I don't think we're going to see some major changes. Yeah, I think it's, well, I'd almost go with the opposite of what the person was saying in the question. I think that the track limit should only be where there's a curb for exactly the reason that Keith has said. I don't, I think when you just have this racetrack and then the green paint and a penalty, it, it, it's, it's too, it's too small a margin. At least when you've got some curbing in between, the rider knows he's on the curb. He knows he's, he's, he's near the edge of the track. So at least there's something there to tell the rider, look, you know, you're right on the limit now. When you haven't got the curb, it's just, it's just tarmac and, and then a bit of paint. Well, you know, I think it's too easy to accidentally or, you know, without consequence, drift into the green, as exactly as Keith says, maybe just returning from the curb and you just touch it. So I'd actually go the other way. I would say no track limits unless you've got some curbing to actually separate it from the racetrack. I think that would be better. Well, there you go, Andrew. There's your, there's your answer. Um, that just about does it for our, our first proper episode, I suppose, of, uh, of season two. We're officially back in action because we will be back next week and pretty much every week after that i think until someone says please please god stop uh because the moto gp season <laughs> is back uh, and qatar gets underway next weekend and we'll be here uh, to preview that before and review it straight after as well in the meantime you can of course keep up to date with everything that's going on in moto gp land and beyond on the crash.net website uh, any questions uh, you've got as always, send them in all the usual ways. Comment section, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook us. Just search Crash Moto GP. Uh, do make sure you uh, subscribe to the Crash Moto GP YouTube channel as well, because that's where we are in vision and in sound. You can hear us on all usual podcast players. Just make sure uh, you leave us a review if you liked it as well. But I think that just about does it from me, Harry Benjamin, Keith Ewan and Pete McLaren. Thank you very much, gents. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>